I now invite one of the graduate award winners, Thomas DeWitt, to come forward and give the valedictory, the address of leave taking. Ms. Schmitz, Dr. Boyle, Deacon Nicklaus, members of the faculty and staff, parents, friends, benefactors, and guests. On behalf of the class of 2021, I would like to thank you all for being here today. As uncertainty, frustration, and worry have become normal undercurrents in our lives, you have continued to support and motivate us. Our teachers have kept the flame of Trinity alive, finding ways to continue our pursuit of truth, beauty, and goodness, even in a strange and masked distance environment, at least in the important ways. Meanwhile, Mr. Hendrickson saved us all a few dollars in razors by blinking at ever more egregious violations of Trinity's facial hair policy. <laughs> Turns out masks had some unexpected benefits. We, as a class and our friends, have helped each other along on our journey and have become even closer to each other despite, or perhaps as a result of, our separation into pods. The premise of Lord of the Flies seems slightly less believable to me after spending nine months with the same 30 people. And though it may seem no more than a cliche in the genre of valedictory addresses, we thank our parents. You helped us to continue our studies over Zoom when we were quarantined. You planned class parties amidst COVID restrictions. And you did these things in addition to what you already do, arranging carpools, chaperoning for us, and volunteering at sports events, to name only a few. For everything you have done for us, and for all that you have given so that we could stand here today, thank you. And now, here we are, taking our farewells. In a few minutes, we'll walk across the stage to receive our diplomas, a piece of paper telling us that the last four years were not a dream. We stand here in what may be the last moment where we are all gathered together as a class before we scatter across the country and prepare to enter a world which seems to be like a spinning top, becoming more unpredictable and unstable as time goes on. But we do not simply walk willy-nilly into the chaos. We are sent forth, as a mission statement says, to be of use to God in the wise care and governance of his creation and in the building of his kingdom. We are not here simply because we have served our sentence in the education system. Instead, we have a duty to perform. This duty to build the kingdom is indeed a monumental task. And as we set forth, it may seem to be nothing more than a pipe dream. Having witnessed the tragedies of the past year and knowing that difficulties inevitably lie ahead in our futures, we might either renounce this duty altogether or simply turn a blind eye to it all. Perhaps we'll become inured to tragedy with only the worst of events turning our heads. So how has our education prepared us to perform this duty and resist throwing up our hands and abandoning it? In the philosophy we have read, we've seen the rational calculation of the human mind, trying to understand itself, other humans, and indeed, the entire world. And more than that, to use that understanding to bring happiness to the human race. We surveyed the foundations of liberal democracy with Locke and Rousseau. We scanned the vistas of history with Hegel and tried to construct the perfect city with Plato. However, all of these works have left us with more questions than answers. Aristotle, Descartes, Montaigne, and others have tried to answer these questions, but instead merely raised more. So here we still are. Despite countless brilliant minds wrestling with these questions of good, evil, and human existence, Despite everything we have tried, the world still contains a great deal of suffering. It seems that as long as we continue to do the reasonable, the rational thing, to calculate, blame, replace the old with the new, we will continue to go nowhere in a great many steps. For all our technology, all our free and democratic societies, all our equal opportunity, people are still miserable. Even where we have eased our physical hardship, we have often simply exchanged it for mental and spiritual burdens. Admittedly, we at Trinity have been lucky. We've had the luxury of standing back from the fray for a few years and struggling with these questions, living what I've heard detractors call 
insulated, suburban, middle-class, private school lives. The implication being that because the works we have studied have not brought us answers, they have wasted our time and they have lost all relevance because they have failed to answer our questions. And while the socio-economic adjectives I used are probably fairly accurate, we have only been insulated and foolish if, when we leave today, we go forth and enter the world on its own terms, agreeing that we have wasted our time and treating the past four years as merely a series of mental gymnastics. But here at Trinity, we've been prepared not to do this. As seniors, we read Fyodor Dostoevsky's famous novel, The Brothers Karamazov. I could sing its praises for hours on end, but Mr. Herndon was forced to remind me that I'm giving a valedictory address, not an essay on Dostoevsky, so I'll keep it brief. It's a really good book. <laughs> One event of the novel bears a striking resemblance to our situation now. The novice Alyosha is sent forth into the world by his dying mentor Zosima, sent away from the peaceful solitude of the monastery. Though perhaps he leaves with more than a touch of disillusionment, questioning what he has been told and believed, he is still not without regret at leaving. But he's not rejected. Rather, he is sent forth to sojourn in the world. And as he is sent forth into his new vocation, he goes with Zosima's words ringing in his ears. Practice active love. But what does this mean? While the philosophers sparked heated intellectual debates among us, they spoke of virtue, not of love. To learn of this love, we turn to literature. Shane fighting to save the farm. Boo Radley watching over Scout and Jem. Achilles returning Hector's bodies to Priam. Sidney Carton giving up his life. These were the moments when the classroom fell silent. For in these irrational acts of active love, we saw humans at their finest. Their rationality and their beauty stems from the fact that they are performed without any care for the doer's personal gain. They are performed simply for the sake of the other person, even with the knowledge that this act can never be repaid. But we did not only see examples of active love in literature, mathematics and physics, music, even the questions of philosophy, all these are the works of active love, seeking out truth, beauty, and goodness, not for the self, but for others. By participating in these, we too have learned to love the world by joining in this search. But active love is not merely a noble thing we find in stories, or the driver of the work of some great philosopher or mathematician. We also have encountered acts of love in our daily lives here, smaller ones to be sure, but no less important. Many of our teachers display a great deal of active love simply by being here, rather than pursuing careers where they might make a good deal more money to do a good deal less work. They've instead chosen to come here and share their love for the world with us. When they might feel a strong urge to throw up their hands and move on, it is this love, perhaps, which enables them to instead patiently lead us through the subject at hand. We've also seen this love for each other, in the classroom and out of it. The unspoken camaraderie when facing a difficult math problem. Arranging a welcome party for the sixth graders, just because. Singing sea shanties in the parking lot after a drama performance. None of these things were forced upon us. We did them simply out of our joy at being alive and our care for one another. It seems then that active love is not an impossible heroic injunction for us, at least not impossible, but still heroic. Not in a world-shaking way, but in a quiet, profound way, which demands constant little sacrifices from us. We may never save a child's life, or be given the option to sacrifice ourselves to reunite someone with their family. But if we can change even one life for the better through little acts of active love, that is enough. Even if it only be for one person, we can, through these little acts, slowly bring truth to light, create beauty, and reveal goodness in a world which desperately needs all three of these. I wish to close with a final quote from Dostoevsky. Active love is a harsh and fearful thing compared with love and dreams. Love and dreams thirsts for immediate action, quickly performed and with everyone watching, whereas active love is labor and perseverance, and for some people perhaps, 
a whole science. But I predict that even in that very moment, when you see with horror that despite all your efforts, you have not only not come nearer your goal, but seem to have gotten further from it. At that very moment, I predict this to you. You will suddenly reach your goal and will clearly behold over you the wonder-working power of the Lord, who all the while has been loving you and all the while has been mysteriously guiding you. Let us go forth then to labor and persevere in love. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas.